No. Hello? Hello? I'm connected. Yeah. I don't know what you're uh, I can't tell. I can hear myself. Can you all hear me now? Yeah. Now you can? Yes? OK, perfect. <laughs> awesome. Woof. Thank you all for joining me, everyone in the crowd, as well as my panelists <coughs> here. Um, maybe it would be best if we start with a quick introduction, if you all could just sort of like give a little explainer about your projects, what you work on. Anna, if you want to go first. Absolutely, yes. So my name is Anna Tumadara. I'm entertained because it's phonetically written out in the intro. Um, we can spend more time on that later. Um, I'm from Creative Commons. I'm COO there. And Creative Commons, for those who are not familiar with it, um, is the organization behind the CC licenses. It was founded about 20 years ago. And if you are familiar with open source code licenses, like GPL or the MIT license, this is the content equivalent. So anything that is not code can be CC licensed if you would like to share it for reuse or remixing. Hi, I'm Adeline Zhou. I'm uh, at Chainlink, um, Chainlink Labs, and I lead our ecosystem. And what Chainlink does is we provide an Oracle infrastructure layer for blockchain projects. So a lot of the DeFi projects you see use us to bring on-chain, off-chain data. We work a lot with NFTs to uh, do randomness uh, NFTs, as well as dynamicism, which we can talk about later. Um, yeah. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Nancy Baker Cahill. I'm a new media artist. I'm based in Los Angeles. I have my own augmented reality public art platform called Fourth Wall. And I've done a number of NFT projects, some of which have been critical in nature, um, really trying to just push into some of the vulnerabilities and opportunities of, of blockchain technologies and, and as they relate to some social issues. Amazing. Well, yeah, thank you all for that. Uh, maybe Nancy, to kick it off and start with you. Um, I mean, so typically when people think about NFTs and resilience, I think the most canonical version of that is trying to think about, well, how do I make sure that this thing sticks around? I'd be curious, as you think about NFTs in your work and sort of the mediums that you use to store data, what are the considerations that you have? What are the risks and challenges that you've seen? Have you thought about solutions? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's one thing I'm super interested in, particularly as an artist that straddles, I would say, a more traditional fine art practice and a digital art practice. But I know this is something that's common to most artists, is like, we want to know, are these, uh, are these NFTs going to last? Where will they live? What is their longevity? What kind of legacy are we leaving here? And how is that legacy going to be protected? And so I think that those are some of the, the core issues. And then, of course, like, how can we adapt smart contracts in ways that fulfill the conceptual needs of these projects over time. Um, whether they're just created for a moment in time or they're intended to have longer lifespans, I think resilience is a crucial question and it's the one that I feel you know, sort of as an ecosystem, there's in, an increasing interest in um, both innovating and exploring what's possible. And I know that I did a little bit of research. I read your Medium, uh, <laughs> your Medium post, which was excellent. And I personally am just very intrigued by, you know, ideas of auto repair and, um, you know, this idea of having some sort of storage endowment that could sustain work not just over, you know, a decade, but you know, hundreds of years even, you know, that, and, and I don't know how to sort those problems. Those sound like very complicated problems to me, particularly in terms of like the original integrity and codex of these works. But um, yeah, I think that's a, a, that's a primary importance to most artists and to not just artists, but c institutions that collect art that are serving a larger public and, and really want these, to, these assets to remain in perpetuity. Yeah, and it's interesting too if we like sort of piece that with like how people have thought about like traditional archives as well. It's not just like the file formats and the tools that we have today. It's also like, well, how do we make it possible for someone in the future to be able to render your art when technology's improved and changed and these are the outdated versions of things? I mean, maybe to extend it a little bit more, when we think about resilience, it also comes into like the legal context as well and how we think about both coming up with like the legal structures and also like the tooling to bridge between this new medium and sort of the existing legal technologies. I'm curious, Anna, if you have any sort of thoughts or reflections on ways we can sort of improve the state of the art and where we are today even. Well, and I think you just hit the nail on the head too when you're thinking about what things look like today and how you can make sure that they sort of are resilient and work in the future. It's the similar question with IP. 
key. So instead of necessarily getting too tied into a specific type of technology or programming language or function, um, we need to think about things are going to continue to change. And so the CC licenses, you know, they're, they're a global standard and they're a norm for open sharing and they worked in Web 1 and Web 2 wasn't great for them. But, you know, ideally they will work in Web 3 and, and beyond. Um, I think one of the things we need to think about is just making sure that when we do try to adapt to new new ways of communicating you know art or creation that whatever we do from a legal perspective and from a technological perspective that it doesn't get so complex and in the weeds that it's then impossible to carry that forward when there are developments in the field maybe nancy to also just as someone who is on the creator side of things how have you sort of like found navigating like the legal space with the nft space as sort of a thing that came out of left field and now we're trying to figure out how do we apply digital like well in this new digital realm existing legal frameworks what what have you well, experienced well that's also obviously of primary importance i think there's a misunderstanding that if you mint something you've copyrighted it you have definitely not done so and we had a fascinating backstage conversation, the three of us, about this very comp also equally thorny issue around IP as it relates, obviously, to Creative Commons, but also to um, the, quote, immutability of the asset you know, on the blockchain and how does that, how do we protect those things? And, and one of the, my earliest project, a project called Contract Killers, really explored legal rights as they relate to collector and artist through the lens, like basically using the, la the contractual language of blockchain to explore these. And I've collaborated on two big projects projects actually with um, an art attorney, an IP art attorney named Sarah Odenkirk, who has really helped me as an artist walk through what are your legal protections outside of this space and then what are they within the space and how can they, how can we encode, enshrine, um, write those into the metadata or to documents attached to the metadata to protect not just the artist but also the collector, again, in perpetuity. Because I think it's been, you know, what's beautiful about the moment and, and with the way that, that so much of this content can be disseminated widely is that it can be disseminated widely. And what's also difficult in these moments are these moments of like contested authorship and um, things being reminted. I mean, that happened a lot in the beginning, certainly like artworks being basically reminted and claimed by other people. So um, yeah, that's, that's something that's very much top of mind and continues to be because I don't think it's been solved at all. 100%. Well, maybe Adeline to talk a little bit about the work that Chainlink does. I know you guys think a lot about dynamic NFTs and some of the additional use cases. I mean, the, purely in the artistic context, I think we've seen a lot of really interesting experiments, but also even what that enables for bridging further out. Uh, so yeah, I'm curious, when yeah. you think about dynamic NFTs, what are the opportunities that you sort of see on the horizon? Yeah, so uh, dynamic NFTs, right, for um, some people might not quite uh, know them, are what I consider living NFTs. So historically, NFTs, the most popular kind that we're familiar with are the static ones where you know you have a profile picture and that's kind of it. But dynamic NFTs takes those to the next level. So the token ID still is the same, but the metadata within that NFT changes. So for example, um, that NFT, right, can change with the weather. Like you might have a figure and if it's raining, it might you know, have rain come down. Or if it's sunny, it's uh, sunny. A uh, popular one recently we did with the NBA, the association, was uh, for the 2020 playoffs, where there is a set of uh, 16 different NFTs, and based on how the basketball players played, and if they made it to you know the play, uh, finals, their NFT would change. So they would you know, evolve over time and to become, you know, I guess even cooler, right? Even more attractive. And so as the owner of NFT, you no longer just own a static image, it changes. And so uh, when we talk about resiliency, you know, I think that dynamic NFTs and the ability to connect these NFTs to something greater than what's just in there statically is like a next phase that I'm very excited to see. Well, it's also interesting if you think of it as like allowing digital objects to have some of the properties of physical objects, where it's like if you have boots that you're walking around in, they get like a patina on them over time. And like, how do you allow that to happen and have works that maybe can degrade if that's an intentional component of it, or even be like have many artists contributing to it over time? Um, I guess one thing I'm curious, maybe for all three of you, if you want to go one by one, 
when you think about the open challenges in the space, are there any particular things that you see as being like the lowest hanging fruit of areas where collectively we as a community come together to solve some of the open challenges? I like how you say lowest hanging fruit, because I'm like, how much time do we have to talk about the complex challenges about 15 in the space? Minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that there is still a lot that needs to be clarified from uh, a legal certainty perspective on the IP front related to NFTs. And I think it's going to be really important for the creators that are creating and minting. I also think it's going to be important for those who want to think about using NFTs in contexts other than, you know, what I would say is like the popular context of digital art. So for instance, if you were to imagine um, somebody creating a textbook, right? And so you make this textbook and you know it's on English literature and you mint an NFT of it, but maybe you have licensed it in such a way that I can come and I can contribute to this textbook. And maybe I can add a chapter or I can add some footnotes or whatever the case may be and then somebody else can do something on top of that. Is that a dynamic NFT or am I taking your work and am I remixing it and reminting a new version of it? However this looks, I think there's a lot of interesting challenges and opportunities here to acknowledge who has put something into the work and to keep track of how it has changed over time. And maybe there is a teacher somewhere that really likes your version and doesn't like my version, and then they are able to focus on that versus the other. I feel like this technology should be able to help us do better in terms of understanding who's, who's done what, when, what it was worth, and how it's being used. But this sort of like tree of provenance and input, I think, um, I haven't seen live use cases of it yet. Which is interesting, because I think this is actually a problem that is broader than any one context. Uh, mm -hmm. I know for a lot of people who think about how do we like attribute value to the contributions people have made for public goods. Yeah. So like research is actually the collaboration of so many different folks. It could be research in one field that gets picked up by someone else and like 10 years later, 50 years later, ends up being the basis for a massive breakthrough and like cancer research or something. And so how do we figure out how to have those value attribution structures, which then can plug into all these other public goods funding tools that people are working on? Um, well, maybe Adeline, I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are on, in terms of open challenges that you'd be interested in seeing people to put some brain space yeah. behind. I think one of the things is really just the creativity, and I think we're waiting for even more of that. I think the artists, you know, create, uh, the um, artist groups, like you guys have really embraced NFTs, but I think there is so much more. So what I'm saying is, uh, I think someone put it really well, like when the paper was first invented, right, we didn't know, they were like, oh, you know, maybe we could write some stuff on there, but then thousands of years later, it became a place where people wrote like a declaration of independence and, you know, here we are in the United States, you know, not here in the United States, but <laughs> like it's changed like the course of the like different countries in the world. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think with NFTs and, and we're just still waiting to see even more use cases and opportunities being placed on this blank canvas, right, that was created. And uh, for us, I mean, I was excited to see just a few weeks ago that a house was sold in South Carolina for I think close to $200,000 that was a pure NFT. So that's like the first time you're really starting to see people you have the use case of tokenization of world world assets. That's when you can really see value coming into the space and I think that's what we're really excited about. People taking these and being more creative with the ideas and actualizing them with NFTs. Yeah, I mean, I agree with, with both of your assessments. And I would just add one, interoperability, like mm -hmm. first and foremost, just because of all the work that's already been done, but also to facilitate, as you say, additional new creative iterations, of which there are an infinite number. Yes. Two, I think what you said about, you know, these overlap, like inter the idea of like more interdisciplinary collaboration in like, if you look at like DSI or other, other um, kind of ecosystems that are working and developing their own kind of patterns, how could we access those? How could they get access to us, us to them, et cetera? And then really on a base level, how do you make these more um, innovative like projects possible yeah by creating interfaces that make it possible for artists who maybe aren't as versant, aren't as fluent in some of these languages that don't have the resources yeah. even to work with a dev to do the more you know, conceptually rigorous or challenging work. Like how do we, how do we make it more accessible? That's a, I think that's a remaining challenge that really hasn't been addressed. And I think that some of the like 
plug and play options or the kind of like platforms that quote unquote make it easy come with a lot of compromises. When you're either paying you know, too much royalty or your metadata is like the simplest, most like brittle, you can't do anything with it. Like there are all these drawbacks. So I guess this is like pie in the sky, but like what is that perfect um, onboarding mechanism that would really allow people with big imaginations, big ideas to push into to new territories and really challenge what's even possible? Because you're right, I mean, if, the, if the analogy is paper, like there's so much we can do. Um, so that's what I would, those are the challenges that I see like just right ahead. I'm sure there are much more massive ones um, in, you know, beyond that, but those are the ones as an artist anyway that I think about a lot. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I like to think about, especially in spite of the Web3 space, effectively what we're building is digital public infrastructure, where it's like, it could be coming from like the NFTs as art side or NFTs as like financial transactions, but like whoever does the incremental work to like build whatever new system on top is now deployed for anyone else to use. I mean, fractional is like one example, like that could be used to fractionalize like some piece of art, but it could also be used if you have a corporate bond as an NFT in another context. And so, oh, yeah. Well, I just think to your point, I think what's, what's necessary then is a certain literacy yeah. um, among different stakeholders across industries. You know, particularly in like, I think about like the civic realm, like more, like the, the, the application of blockchain and NFTs in a civic space and a civic realm would be transformative, particularly with these really old, sluggish, and especially when we get into conversations around time and speed and the ways in which, you know, the, there are certain efficiencies and, and that could, they could make things so much better, but there's no literacy around it, you know? And so how do you address that as well? And just think it's related to what you're saying. Yeah, and I think it comes to like, there's both an education component. So like, how do we onboard the rest of the world? There's also like the infrastructure component, which is like, how do we make sure that if you are aware of this stuff, you aren't stuck with a subset of the functionality that the real world today gives you? And then over time, if we get both of those, we sort of have the flywheel that can kick off where you'll have more, experiment more experimentation from more people. Um, I guess it's up to, on the infrastructure side, we got more to do. On the legal <laughs> side, you got some work to do. <laughs> Just a lot um, of work still. <laughs> I guess I, I'm curious, so the NFT space moves quite quickly. I'm curious if there is anything that uh, I, any of you have as like specific areas that you're particularly focused on that you find fascinating that maybe are out of your core specific realm. Is there one area that you're keeping an eye on because you're particularly excited about? That's an interesting question. Um, I'm pretty focused in the core specific realm of copyright. Um, and I will say that it's an area that Creative Commons is closely keeping an eye on because um, there is a massive proliferation of the use of CC licenses and the CC0 public domain dedication in the NFT artist community. And it's, it's very clear that norms have yet to emerge there the way that they have emerged in, um, shall we say, pre-Web3 media. And so I would say in the coming, in the coming months, um, we're going to be placing probably a more significant emphasis on helping people navigate that and helping, helping figure out what is something that can, speaking of resiliency um, and sort of provenance and so on, like can help the artists be guaranteed that like what they want is, is what comes to fruition. But similarly, if somebody's supporting the artist, that what they expect from it comes to fruition. I mean, it's, it's fascinating to me that like if I walked into an art gallery here in Lisbon and, and bought art off the wall, it would not occur to me that I could then go digitize that and put it on a t-shirt and put it on a car. Like, like that, it just, it, just, it just would not seem like the natural next step you would do after buying somebody's art. But yet, in the digital realm, people are running into this. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's wild and it's, you know, I would say, not particularly respectful of the work that the artists have put into it. And so, I think there's just a lot to be done in terms of um, helping with sort of like the certainty factor around this space. Mm -hmm. On my side, I mean, one, dynamic NFTs and this tokenization of what wow, assets you represented by NFTs, I'm very excited about. And then my background, actually, I've been in marketing a lot of it, and so I'm actually excited about these loyalty points and like using that and how do you tokenize that and, and using NFT. So I'm excited to see more. Like, could our you know, American Airlines or Delta Miles be you know put onto NFTs and as a badge of you know what kind of 1,000K you know uh, flyer you are? So curious about that. 
Um, I'm really interested in, back to sort of civic uses, looking at um, biomimicry, actually, looking at networks in nature, like mycelial networks, looking at the way they operate with a certain interoperability and distributive um, care, and how, they, how, how information and crucial information is distributed within those systems, and really holding them as, as a, a model to, through which we could apply a certain, look, look for points of overlap and intersection with uh, Web3 technologies, and how could those two things be blended, or at least one, how could one inspire the other to create um, new systems, or like, as you're saying, like new incentives for a different level of mutual aid, community care, reparation, cultural preservation. I mean, I just think that like, when we really look at what at the challenges we're facing, certainly globally, obviously, but, but especially um, nationally, I just think there's an urgent need to use these technologies, not just responsibly and respectfully, as you say, but to actually serve a common good and um, not to, always be in this sort of extractive model um, of, of profit and, and where, how could we use them uh, with different, different types of value and different types of, types of profit. It's interesting to me, one thing <laughs> I think about a lot, and yeah, <laughs> after that, I think about this a lot too in terms of like, we have these new tools and there's a bunch of different ways that we can use them. One is this fact that once you have digital scarcity, you can take things that normally are status games and like play them in different contexts. Yep. And so I think Vitalik talked a little bit about like how do we use NFTs for social good, redirecting some of the speculative fear that has taken some of the NFTs, but direct it towards like how do we fund public goods overall? But also even like the fact that NFTs are bi-directional in the sense that like you as, I think there was a podcast or some Web3 critic who was talking about uh, Mark Andreessen. He was asked like, oh, what would you do with a Web3 podcast? And I think Mark was grasping a little bit for like what are ideas of like how we could use this technology. But like one clear one is, look, if I want to be able to send something to my community to just even as like a little badge of like you're a part of this thing, like Web3 gives you the rails to like engage with communities in different ways. And I think it's really interesting to start thinking about about like these are just different tools, and once we solve the resiliency piece, we solve the like the expressivity piece. We can do so much more. Um, yeah, totally. But yeah, I guess we have a couple minutes left. Uh, I'm curious, are there any last callouts that maybe you each have? Any project you want to shout out? Things that you wish the audience would maybe uh, take a look at? Well, I'm personally curious about dynamic NFTs since they are something I've recently learned about, thanks to Adeline. Um, but they do get me thinking about in the, how that intersects potentially with the public good space around science, research, data, educational materials, et cetera, things that change over time and how you can communicate different elements of the things that it has changed over time. But I'm also curious, of course, about versioning, like I mentioned, and if it does change, like, is there going to be a process by which I could still go back in time to um, an earlier, earlier state that something was in? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think it evolves, right? It's um, We were talking behind him how these dynamics can change over time. Um, I mean, ones I'm excited about, I, there's so many applications. Like, uh, if you're a gamer, right? I was telling you, it's like, you have a sword in a game, and right now that sword could be an NFT, it could be just a wood sword, but say you kill 10 monsters, they can have to like a metal sword and then kill another hundred and create a diamond sword. And so that is an NFT that has more value that you could trade. Um, a really cool example uh, was recently an art, like Diana Sinclair. She just did a auction of her art called Phases, where her she was trying to show how you know life and has the phases and life and death and changing. And blockchain by itself, you can't really tell time. And so her NFTs incorporated part where they could die over time, or if you traded that NFT, it would change and regenerate and go back to the beginning again, like you were asking the versioning, go back to the beginning and relive. And so I, I think there's just so many possibilities with that. Yeah, I mean, I'm also super interested in how far you could push a dynamic NFT, particularly in a larger sort of infrastructure build that serves serves a certain community. Um, I'm really interested in the role that libraries are going to end up playing with with blockchain and that kind of um, cultural value. Again, you know, the kinds of incredible artifacts we have already, and. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I don't know, I, I don't want to get too specific, um, but I think that, that it's a pretty um, open field right now, and it's a really exciting time to be a, a creative in the space. Thank you all, I really appreciate you uh, sharing you. your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you.